Welcome to Real Truth and Power Live, where we provide powerful content to uplift the black community with health, wealth, and knowledge of self. I'm going to start the show in a couple of minutes. Let's allow the family to get into the building. Welcome to Real Truth and Power Live, where we provide powerful content to uplift the black community with health, wealth, and knowledge of self. We have a powerful show today, but before I introduce our guests, I just got to pay the bills. So please hit the like, hit the subscribe button. In fact, let's pause on the count of three, hit the subscribe or like or both button. One two, three. Awesome. So now we're ready to go. Remember, if you don't have time to watch the video, you're up and about, please follow our podcast on Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google, we're everywhere. You can also get the content on our website, realtruthandpower.org. So um, without further ado, we're going to talk about uh, some finances today, and I want to bring in a powerful, powerful brother with a lot of knowledge, and he wants to give the information to the people. So let me start right now by introducing um, Mark Fuller, and let me bring him in. All right, All right bringing in, in my guest, I'm, I'm very excited and proud, and proud to, to talk to Mark Fuller. Mark, Mark please uh, introduce yourself to the people, give them a little... Um, background about the things you do? Hey, well, first of all, let me thank you, Eric, for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, always glad to talk to you. You know, we go back a long way, all the way to elementary school. Walk, you know? Walking to school together. There you go. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson Elementary. That's right. It seems like 100 years ago. You know, we old men now. <laughs> right. But um, my name is Mark Fuller. Uh, my company is Manager of Wealth, LLC. And I started that company uh, basically because I realized that a lot of the financial professionals, and when I say financial professionals, I'm talking about stockbrokers, financial planners, uh, accountants, uh, mortgage planners, real estate agents, they give uh, their clients advice and a lot of the advice is contradictory. And since most of the financial professionals don't really have a background in the disciplines of the other professionals, uh, people tend to get a lot of things, they tend to get a lot of things wrong and people's advice tends to kind of contradict other advice. And so I learned very early on a lot of the different disciplines from uh, accounting to financial planning to the stock market and what have you. And I was able to bring that into the mortgage industry and into the planning industry. And so Manager of Wealth is really a service that had started out managing the professionals that manage people's money. And uh, now, you know, what we do is we're an educational company that does a lot of work around uh, planning and commercial real estate and really just advising folks so that we can really get on page with what's going on in this new world that we're going into. And um, I'm glad you mentioned that. I want you to elaborate a little bit more about your services but before we go into that talk about some of the issues as a community black people we are having as far as generational wealth saving money what's the issue that we're having where does that come from well well the first thing is our understanding of of, of money uh at its root and how it is to be how it is to be used and which of these systems we should participate in so uh, anybody who follows me knows I am absolutely not a fan of the uh, stock market. It's not that I don't think there's a lot of money in the stock market. It's that I believe that the vast majority of people that are invested in the stock market are invested in the stock market through their retirement plan, through 
IRAs, 401ks, 403bs if you're a teacher or work for a nonprofit, and thrift savings plans if you work for the federal government. Those plans, most people don't know the history of those plans and don't understand that the reason why the vast majority of people in this country are not meeting their retirement goals is not just lack of savings and planning, but they're in a horrible vehicle that really cannot yield uh, what they are uh, hoping to yield. At the end of the day, we are taught uh, finance from an asset accumulation standpoint. We just want to get to the point where by the time we retire, we've accumulated a million dollars. But nobody has ever told you that if you have a million dollars uh, and you want to retain that million dollars in retirement, you can't draw down but 4% of that million dollars. That's $40,000 a year right. on money that's never been taxed. So let's just assume that you're in a 25% you know, tax bracket. That's uh, right there, that's 10,000 gone. You're gonna be a millionaire, but you're gonna have a $30,000 a year net income. You know, That's not what people are shooting for, but when you watch like an ING commercial, you see them walking around holding a big number telling you what number are you shooting for. Right, right. right. And so you've got everybody shooting for a number, everybody shooting for a number, but we don't understand pre-tax plans versus post-tax plans. We don't understand. Uh, uh, let, me, let me give you an example. In the real world, right? In the real world, Everett, if, you, if I said to you, Everett, give me $100,000 and I'm going to put it into my business and I expect that business to make 400000 So if my business makes $400,000, i am going to give you your $100,000 back and I'm going to give you 100000 on top of that, right? And you say, hey, you know, that's a pretty good return. Uh, it looks like you know what you're doing. It's worth the risk, blah, 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 blah. If I put that 100000 in a business and it didn't make 400000 it only made 300000 what would you expect to receive in return? In right, the real world. Right. I mean, I want, you, I want, I want, I want something. You want your money, right? right. Okay. Money. Well, think about this in the stock market. An analyst says, let's take a stock. Let's just say Microsoft. Analyst says, next year, we expect the company to make a $5 billion profit, right? Microsoft ends up having some challenges that year. Microsoft makes a $3.5 billion profit instead of a $5 billion profit. The stock price goes down, <laughs> right? Right. You own the stock. You don't own the dividend. So none of that profit is yours. It is, and, and what ends up happening is if it was trading at $50 a share because it didn't meet its estimate, it goes down to $22 a share. You lost money and the company made a profit. Things like that will destroy your financial portfolio, not understanding that if a dollar is made and you don't get any of it, you can't do that on, in, a, in a sustained way and hope to actually have any capital at the end of uh, when, when you uh, get to retirement age. Also, all of the principles that they teach about retirement, things like dollar cost averaging and, and uh, diversification and all of those things, those things only work in a market that is going up and it only works when you are of a certain age. And to give you an example, think about 2008, Everett. In 2008, the market crashed. Right. If you were 25 to 30 years old and you were just getting into the workforce and you were saving money in your IRA, 401k, thrift savings plan, you have time to rebound. But if you were 60 years old in 2008 and you had 700,000 in your retirement plan and it, got, it took a 50% haircut and now you're at 350,000, you have no time to... Uh, to rebound. So all of that diversification, just keep investing, just keep, you know, it all depends on where you're standing as to whether the advice is any good. So I'm trying to help people develop strategies from a platform of understanding information on how to generate capital in good and bad markets that have nothing to do with looking in an envelope at the end of the month to see whether your company made or lost you money. Gotcha. If you're just tuning in, welcome to Real Truth and Power Live podcast. I'm here with the manager of wealth, Mark Fuller. Mark, talk about some 
other options we can do as far as investing. And when I say that, talk about uh, a lot of people that are maybe struggling and just trying to find a way to start saving and figure out themselves. Okay, so literally what I try to encourage everybody to do is to really re, um, reimagine uh, this idea of financial literacy because what we term financial literacy is really financial illiteracy. If you really want to, uh, if you really want to have resources, you've got to look at what the, the, the top one to three percent are doing with their capital. First of all, most people who are listening to this podcast, they don't know any stock market uh, uh, millionaires. They don't know anybody who made their wealth, you know, trading in the stock market. But that doesn't mean that they don't know any millionaires. They probably know quite a number. They might have got it from uh, buying real estate. Most likely, they got their money from owning a business. There is no higher return on capital than capital invested in a business. Doesn't matter the business. I don't advocate for any one business over the other. It's simply looking at the numbers of how much capital do you have to invest in terms of marketing to generate a client that, and the client is profitable to you and once you get that formula down, everything in that business becomes about scaling. Everything becomes about scaling. If you can figure out how to invest $100 to make $1,000, you have the formula for making millions of dollars. It doesn't really get harder than that, but we do some very peculiar things with, um, we do some very, very peculiar things with money once we start making it. Not only in terms of overconsumption, you know, which is the most obvious, you know, we're, we're, we're celebrating too early. We're buying the, the larger house. We're buying the larger car. We're doing the, uh, we're going heavy on the, the, the private school and all that. We're going heavy on that stuff too early in the game when we just figured out how to make some money, but we haven't figured out how to scale. Right. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how to scale which means that you have to figure out how to maximize. And I, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I see clients do this every day. Let's talk about, I, I, like to, I don't like to talk about things that are failing. I like to talk about things that are successful because for us, one of the ways that you know that uh, financial liter illiteracy is rampant is that it is our most successful businesses that make the strangest uh, decisions with capital. So let me tell you what is average in a, in, in a black business. So you figured out, you got a business, you set the business up, it looks right, you know your stuff, everything's going well, you get your first seven figure year. And I've seen this, I've, I've seen this a hundred times, literally in business with, with, with uh, clients. Okay, you just made a million and a half this year, after you paid your overhead for the facility and your employees and your taxes and this, that, and the third, you whittle it all down and you made 400 grand net, right? So now after taxes, you got $400,000 in cash. And what do we do with that $400,000 in cash? Well, the first thing we most likely do is put that money into savings, call our financial planner or stockbroker, and say, you know, we're going to save and invest for the future, okay? Sounds like an intelligent play, right? However, think about this. What I, I had a client once that, that, that did exactly this, and then they gave that money to the financial planner. The financial planner put it in the market. The market over the next year had a bad year, and they lost half the money, oh, right? Man. Okay? Now, when I looked at that client's financials, I looked at their tax return, saw that they had made one and a half million and made a net of 400,000. I immediately went to the marketing line on their tax return and saw that they had only spent $60,000 that year on marketing, right? So I said, wow, you spent $60,000 a year on marketing and, and, and grossed one and a half million. Obviously, what do I know from that? I know that person knows something about marketing that product or service that they have 
that generated that capital, right? Right, right. They know that business. If I don't know anything else, I know they know that business. So what was the logical thing that they should have done? That 400 grand that they had, they should have invested $120,000, $200,000 into that marketing plan that they had that worked to double down or triple down on the formula that they already had that worked so that they could scale that business. Now, let me ask you this question, Everett. If you um, put $50,000 into or $60,000 into your marketing plan and it made one and a half million, what would happen if you put 120,000 into that same marketing plan? What could you reasonably expect to make? I'm with you there. We're gonna make more money by investing more in our market. I'm with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. But check this out. If you double down on the marketing and let's say you double the revenue, you may have only netted a profit of 400,000 on the first one and a half million. But if you doubled your revenue another one and a half million, all of your overhead was probably in the first one and a half million. So on the second one and a half million, you're not gonna make a profit of 400,000. You might make a profit of 1.2, 1.3 million right. on that. You follow right. me? And so what stockbroker, what financial planner could ever deliver that type of return? You're a better planner, you're a better investor, you're more knowledgeable about what you do than anybody you can hand your money to. And that's one of the critical things that we're doing. So I'm seeing companies, and I'm talking multi-million dollar companies, not doing this. Now, who is the biggest example of somebody who kept doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down on a formula that worked? Jeff Bezos. If you go back and you look at the Amazon story, you'll see that what Jeff Bezos kept doing was he kept, he had the formula for generating those book sales over the internet. And every year, he would take everything that he had made, plus everything that he could get from the public markets, and he would double down again and put even more money into expansion, expansion, and expansion, because he, he was trying to get to a place where he scaled to a place where nobody could catch him. And of course, we see that he's gotten there. Right. That's um that's very good input that you put in. Especially, it, it, it definitely hits home for a lot of business owners that are struggling to make their way. Um, I often tell a lot of people, I believe that black ownership, black business ownership is very crucial to the black community. I was just interviewing um, Brother John from the Collective Black People Movement, and he was talking yeah. about how it is in Atlanta. And mm -hmm. I was transferring Atlanta to Baltimore, where we're from where it's a little different. We have black businesses, but it's not an overwhelming supply of them. And for you to be able to encourage black businesses or businesses to invest back in themselves as part of investing, I think that is crucial. Um, but talk about the lack of businesses um, that we have in, in the black community and what, why is that? How can we help that out? And how, what, what kind of programs do you offer well, what kind of other things do you do to help business owners, you know, increase their wealth? Well, first of all, one of the things that most people don't know is the state of Maryland actually on a per capita basis has the most black businesses of any other state in, in the United States. No right? way. I didn't yeah, know that. Absolutely. Yeah, wow. well, yeah, absolutely. The state of Maryland actually has the most uh, uh, black businesses of any state, actually. Wow. So we're, so we're, not, we're not behind per se uh, Atlanta and, and actually it's 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 interesting because the two places that I've actually done the most business have been Maryland and and, and Georgia in Atlanta. I did a lot of real estate development uh, in in Atlanta. Um, so <laughs> the uh, uh, perception and the way people think in Atlanta is, is is a bit different, and a lot of that is attribute attributable to a gentleman uh, named Herman Russell, right? because Herman Russell is a, he's, he's passed now, but this gentleman is the living embodiment of black history. Uh, Herman Russell owned a contracting uh, and uh, a development company uh, in Atlanta, old school brother. He was the one who really financed a lot of the black politicians and black businesses down there. 
and what have you. And he, most of the things that people look at Atlanta and have seen built, the skyscrapers, the airport, all those things, um, H.G. Russell built most of those things, okay? Wow. So actually the difference between Baltimore, for instance, and Atlanta is that Blacks are in on everything, there, okay? Yeah. They, it's not that, now understand, they are in the middle of the Deep South in an extremely conservative, extremely racist, extremely Klan-filled state. But because of the way that they galvanized themselves together and got their portion of everything, they basically just got their part of everything that was moving down there. So Blacks are inter in intricately woven into the fabric of the development of Atlanta and their politicians, and this is important, their politicians are controlled by their, their black politicians are controlled by their black community, right? That is not true here. Right. Our black politicians in no way, shape or form are controlled by the black constituency. So even though you have a city like Baltimore, Maryland with a 66% black population, the capital that funds the politicians here um, is actually from outside of the community. Right. And so therefore, that's who calls the shots. If you think that that is not true or I'm overstating it, then just simply drive around Baltimore and ask yourself a question. How is it possible that you can have Guilford, Roland Park, Charles Village, Hamden, Locust Point, Silo Point, uh, Harbor East, um, uh, Butcher's Hill, Patterson Park, um, Fells Point, Federal Hill, uh, Roland Park. You see, like, you can go to any section of the city and where those, and where the people who actually uh, control the city, not run the city, because we have black politicians in every uh, position. We got a black mayor, we got black people, quote unquote, managing the money. They ain't controlling the money, they're managing it. So the first thing that you have to do, which they do in Atlanta, which we don't do in Baltimore, is there's a mandate in every city uh, after uh, civil rights came in that basically every city has a mandate as to what percentage of the uh, city uh, contracts are supposed to go to black businesses. Like kind of like the MBE, minority yeah, business. Okay. But understand something. In a lot of these charters, it's what percentage is supposed to go to black businesses, right. not minority businesses, I got because you. we got hustled on that deal nationally in terms of, you know, when we came up with this concept of MBEs and WBEs, when we came up with affirmative action, go look at the statistics. Uh, almost 70% of the recipients of minority business contracts and um, affirmative action hirings and contracts are white women, okay? They are the minority, they yeah. are the, so, so that's where the hustle goes there. But in terms of where the mandate is actually black businesses, nobody is actually enforcing the rules that are on the books in Baltimore. That is, that is our central issue. The rules are already there. You don't have to, you don't got to vote on it, and this, that, and the third. I think it's like, um, it's either 15 or 25%. But we're not seeing 1% of the contracts in the city. If you had black businesses getting their percentage of the contracts in the city, and isn't it, isn't it a strange moniker to, to, to be a minority contractor where you're the majority population, right? Does right, that, I right. mean, in what yeah, world does I that make you. sense? <laughs> right, right, I got Even if, let's say it was 15%, Baltimore has an a annual budget of $3 billion. Bring 15 to 20% of uh, those billions of dollars into the hands of black business owners, and they can control and call their own shots and develop and bring up their other businesses. But if you're getting 1%, of uh, of uh, three billion dollars, and all the other communities are eating off of that. What you will see is things will develop wherever they want them to develop, and they're developing with your tax dollars. So not only so when you see the national news talks about you know the the what Baltimore is crime and this that and the third and da da da, but when you drive around Baltimore 
you know, uh, you're like, you could go east, you can go west, you can go south, you can go north and find a pristine, beautiful community that crime seems to know, don't step over this line. Right, Murder right. seems to know, don't step over this line. But prosperity steps all the way over the line <laughs> and you just see skyscrapers and wealth and restaurants and clubs. And Baltimore is a, 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 a playground and it's being made into a playground because of the high speed train that's coming. See, we're building housing downtown and around the city. It is not in any way, shape or form for the people of Maryland or for the people of Baltimore. It is for the people of New York. It is for the people of Pennsylvania. It's for the people of Washington, DC, okay? Because, and so you had to build up these communities first, right? So they would have somewhere to play because you're not gonna get a person who wants to live in Manhattan but can't afford a $2 million condo to come live in Baltimore in a half a million dollar condo unless you have the lifestyle that they want. So Baltimore built the lifestyle for the desired uh, uh, occupant, said forget about all the other areas in this town, let's build up these 30 areas, right? With this money, at least 20% of which is actually mandated to be going to black businesses, which would give black successful black business owners the incentive to continue to develop their own community, right? Right. But if I don't have the money, I don't have the money. You know right. what I mean? What right. am I what am I building up with? You follow right. me? And so if we don't get control of this thing, because it's way out of control. You know, we've lived here, we've 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 lived here all of our lives. This thing is way out of control. If we don't get our percentage of the budgets of Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Prince George's County, Howard County, these places that we occupy, if we don't get our percentage of those budgets into our businesses, we are basically feeding people with our uh, income tax, um, uh, property tax, and all of our other dollars. We're paying them to destroy us. Wow. We're interviewing Mark Fuller. Um, he's um, part of the manager of wealth. Did I say that correct, Mark? Yeah, manager of wealth, yeah. Okay, LLC. Man, you're just hitting us with a, a lot of knowledge. I had to just pause. Please hit that like and share button. Um, talk about, when we're talking about communities, and maybe not just Baltimore, but a lot of the struggling communities, um, talk about how they can invest in their community. Talk about real estate, some of the things that investing in real estate can help, you know, grow our community. So, and businesses. Yeah. So real estate is an interesting real estate is the interesting animal, and um, the way that it is the way that it is being taught is a bit challenging um, because it's being taught like a it's being taught like a lottery ticket, right? In terms of it's a it's a pie in the sky thing. Actually, it's a very needed and necessary thing, and it's really a place that we need to uh, invest in collectively. And the reason why we need to invest in, in real estate collectively is not only so that we can have control of our neighborhoods and all those things, but it is also something that if we start to um, look at this uh, real estate different, like for instance, I have this um, uh, video running uh, on YouTube, right? And it is a video that like breaks down how you can get five times the return out of some Baltimore row houses uh, than you can out of a million dollars in a 401k, right? Now, Everett, this is a lesson, regardless, this is a lesson that every piece of flesh should understand, right? They, why do they need to understand this? Because income is the key to our survival, right? And I, I, and I, I, always, I, like, I always use this example. If you end up 65 years old and retired and you've got uh, a pension and you're getting a guaranteed hundred thousand dollars a year in income even if you never saved a dime but you're going to get a hundred thousand dollars a year guaranteed you'll be okay you'll be able to survive right but flip the reverse i'll give you a million dollars in cash after you just came from a job where you worked all these years, you worked up to seniority and you retired making $150,000, $160,000 a year. And I'm going to knock you all the way back down to $30,000 a year. Because remember I said a million dollars, you can only get a, 
a 4% return, which is $40,000, and then you got to pay tax on that money. So you're left with a $30,000 net. So here you are, a million dollars, $30,000. $30, How can real estate help to um, uh, dig a lot of us out of that hole of not being prepared for retirement? Well, Baltimore and, and, and cities like Philadelphia are huge row home uh, communities, right? So we have an overabundance and supply of row homes. People should be buying these row homes, rehabbing them, and leasing them out. But more importantly, they should be treating those rentals, right? They should be treating those rentals like they are their uh, 401k investments. Gotcha and not utilize the capital until the houses are paid off. And if you do that and you put the money toward the houses, and I explain that in this video um, where I say, you know, you buy a house, you rehab it, um, you might owe $50,000 on the house, but you're getting $1,500 a month. That's $18,000 a year in revenue, right? 3,000 of that's going toward taxes and insurance. The rest you can put toward the, the, the small mortgage and the spread. Let's say you're making a profit of $700 a month. Save it in a savings account. Just hold on to the money and let it build up. That savings account is going to be three things for you. It is going to be your ultimate payoff account, right? Because ultimately you'll build up enough money to pay off the principal. Uh, also, it'll be your down payment account. It'll be the account that you have cash in that'll allow you to make the down payment on the next piece of real estate. Yeah. And it will be your emergency fund because one of the reasons that some people say, hey, I can't stand real estate is, you know, when a hot water heater breaks or, right. you know, you got a roofing issue or whatever, getting that unexpected $2,000 bill is, 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 is really a nuisance. So that becomes your emergency fund. If we stop spending the money, from the investment before the investment has matured, we will have the investment and all, and we both will have the, the house, the housing completely paid off and free and clear and really own it, but we will also own the income. So now in retirement, let's say it takes seven to 10 years to be able to build up a portfolio and own uh, a portfolio of 10 houses. That $18,000 a year times 10 houses, that's $180 a year, right? $3,000 a, a year in taxes and, and maintenance and whatnot, that's $30,000. That leaves you with one fifty. dollars If you're not paying a mortgage and you got $150,000 cash flow and you've got the asset free and clear, man, it is a whole other world. And it's paying you, that's, that's five times what you would have made with a million dollars in a 401k. That is not a science that we are teaching each other. It isn't taught in school. It is, um, but you know where it is taught is it's taught in your lived experience as you look around a city like Baltimore and you see and you ask yourself, why do these other communities, why do these other uh, uh, people from other communities own 500 homes? They didn't buy those 500 homes for uh, $200,000 a piece. They bought them for $5,000, $10,000, and they monetize those things. Those, those are their stock investments. They're not, they don't sit around with their family talking about IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, and thrift savings plans. You know, if I, if I own half the hood, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good, right. you know, I'm good. And there are people who are applying what I just said. They've been applying it for the last 60 or 70 years in this town, right? And their kids, uh, they're and they're teaching it to their children and they taught it to their children's children and what have you. And it puts them in position. So no, $150,000 a year and free cash flow is not all the money in the world, but it is real security, especially when you have that type of cash flow and you have a million dollars in, in actual assets because you have the hard brick and mortar uh, of houses. We have to learn to do the simple stuff first. And then, as I always talk about, add to it, multiply and scale. Um, that was very powerful because one, you're talking about residual income, income Absolutely. that's coming in monthly. But another thing you're talking about is generational wealth. 
you can pass this on as, as long as you have uh, real estate land property and especially if you're renting it out you've all you always have a source of income that's never going to go you can pass it down Absolutely. so that that is definitely phenomenal um I'm gonna let you go. I got a couple more questions. I don't want, I don't want to hold you up too long. I really appreciate you giving us this powerful information. You, you, you tapped on something about financial literacy. And it seems to me that's what you guys do at Manager of Wealth. You help people get their finances in order to become more financial um, literate. Um, but talk about how we can change this in our community and talk about some of the things you're doing. I know you do a lot of public speaking. Just give out some information where we can contact you and talk about how we can change that narrative. And, and I, I believe personally it starts with the education, the school system. Um, I don't think they do a lot of schools don't even do like home economics anymore or right. things of that nature. So talk about the-, the But it's, um, good that they, it's, it's good that they don't because who would teach it? Yeah. Um, cause, 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 because the, the reality is, is that what we have as education is indoctrination. It is to lead you into a place where when you get that job and they put a form in front of you and tell you that these are your benefits and they hand you a form and it says you can put your life savings into this 401k, this IRA, and you just need to check a box as to whether you are uh, aggressive, moderate, right. or low risk, right? Exactly. Now, if they ask the question another way, if I handed you a piece of paper and said, you could put your life savings into this account, Everett, all I need to know is you got to check one of these three boxes. Do you want to be able to lose all of your money, some of your money, or none of your money? Which box are you going to choose? Uh, none. <laughs> okay, well, if you're going to check, I don't want to lose any of my money, then you would have checked on that uh, IRA or 401k form, uh, the bond fund, which is the low risk fund, right? right? Which is not tied to any stock or whatever. Now, most people say, but Mark, if I, if I check that box, it's only paying a guaranteed two or 3%. How am I going to build up any money, make it two or 3%? And then I would have directed you back to the way that they incentivize you and trick you into getting to the plan in the first place is, the job says they'll give you a match and they say, we'll match the, the first 6%, right? So you make a hundred grand, you put in 6,000, they'll put in 6,000. So think about it. What is a $6,000 return? What percent return is a $6,000 return on $6,000? It's a hundred percent, right? right. Correct. Correct. Okay. So you're not getting, when you check the low box and you're getting a match, you're not getting a 2% or 3% return, you're getting 102 or 103% return guaranteed with no risk. And nobody even explains that to you. So every time the market crashes, all of your, all of your finances crash. So right. first of all, we need people to even understand what they're signing up for because prior to 1977, that option never existed. No such, no such thing prior to 1977 when they made the Retirement and Reinvestment Act, no such thing as an IRA, 401k, 403b, a thrift savings plan, right? Mm. Everybody in America who worked for corporations had pensions. And that was basically an insurance contract that continued to pay you a residual income after you finished working. We have to get back to designing pensions for ourselves through insurance contracts so that we can have that guaranteed income. It's a very simple thing to do and it is what the wealthy do with their capital. 80% of all of the cash value insurance contracts and policies in the world are owned by the wealthy because they're using it for the number one thing, which is income, 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 wealth protection, and tax-free transfer of generational wealth because all money coming out of insurance contracts is completely untaxable. Now, hold on, I gotta cut you off. Okay, most people don't know that. So. I, 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 let, let, let me let me cut you off real quick. You, you might have hit something that I wasn't aware of. Are you saying there's a type of insurance that's kind of like a pension plan that people can get? Absolutely. That's what insurance and, and insurance. And if you ever heard any all all life insurance, all life insurance is completely that money. I don't care whether if I died and left you a million dollars, it's tax free. If I right. died and left you ten million dollars, it's tax free. Okay. 
All annuities are insurance contracts. Money coming out of annuities is tax free. Right. Okay. So what individuals do is they buy cash value life insurance and store up cash because there is no 1099 or any financial statement on the money that's in the policies. Okay. There is no statement issued at the end of the year. So when you, have you ever heard the word trust fund? Right. A trust fund is an insurance. All a trust fund is, it's a fancy word for insurance contract. It's oh, wow. just, I left this money. Okay. I gave it, I made a contract with an insurance company. My family, I've, I've got this hundred million dollars over here. It pays out an income. That's the trust fund. They're distributing it. It's just being held. But if it's being held by insurance company, it's a trust fund. There's not. There's no nothing deep. We just use these. We use these fancy words, and everybody thinks, "Oh, I got to be rich to do this." And da da da. If you went out and bought a five million dollar policy, and then you said, "You know what? If something happens to me, I don't want to give this five million dollars uh, cash to my son. What I really want to do is, I want to give him a million dollars, and I want to take four million dollars." create a trust fund so it goes to my son, it goes to my son's children, it goes to my son's children's children's children and continues to build and continues to pay them a uh, revenue. That's done at an insurance company. It's, wow, not, okay. it's not mystical, it ain't magical. And here's the, here's the funny part about it. The, that's how the entire country used to work. That's how all businesses used to pay their employees pensions. Wow. It is completely open to every person to use the same vehicles to create a pension for themselves that gives them no stock market exposure and no risk. Right. But, okay. you know, and, Man. and listen, I've, I've owned a seven figure policy since I was, uh, I guess, 23, 24. Okay. And the reason why I bought it ever was, and you, you know, me growing up, I won the parent lottery, right? I got, I got, I got good folks that, that, that phenomenal parents, you know, I was like, look, I had always planned that I would be uh, successful, but I'm also from Baltimore. And, you know, even, even in the wonderful neighborhood that we grew up in, we had to travel around town. We had the same exposure as young black men to everything that everybody else did. Right. right. I always said, if I don't make it, somebody, getting, somebody's getting a million dollars. And right. at that age, putting something like that in place was costing me like $75 a month. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't costing me, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, I've paid good market, bad market, whatever. I've paid my insurance bill on my life before every other bill that I ever paid in the month because that's the one that guarantees that my folks are straight. Everything else I deal with. Why? How can I pay more money for car insurance or or health insurance Over life. or whatever than I am to make sure that the that that generation plus I know my parents are so conservative that anything that they get is automatically going to you know right. my nieces and nephews and kids and what have you right. right Julian's kids are straight if I leave my parents a million dollars that I just set up their grand I just set up my parents grandchildren it doesn't happen. Right. You follow what I'm saying? I'm with, it's like, I'm with it. That's generational wealth, right? It's there. generational wealth. And the absolute cheapest and easiest way to pass generational wealth as a foundation is life insurance. There ain't nothing cheaper and it's nothing less expensive that gives more high value than life insurance that has ever been invented in this world, ever. Man, this has just been a powerful interview, Mark. I wish I could keep you on longer. Please educate the people on how they can contact you, um, website, email, and gotcha. also drop a line, because I know you said you had a YouTube channel. Drop yeah. a line where they can watch some of your videos so, as well. So on, um, go to, on, on Facebook, um, go to, uh, on Facebook to, to Manager of Wealth, and you'll see a bunch of uh, videos there, different uh, shows and uh, you'll also see a lot of things posted from uh, my manager of wealth blog. Um, also, um, manager of wealth dot uh, com. Uh, you can reach me at four ten nine zero eight five nine eight seven, and we just have a wealth of uh, of resources, uh, uh, brokers on the um, on for for mortgages. We have insurance professionals. We have attorneys. Um, so anything around finance, 
that you need uh, help and advice around. And we're always having uh, financial seminars and whatnot once the spring starts. So look for a lot of postings on upcoming uh, seminars that teach real financial literacy. I promise you, you will be blown away by the simplicity of, um, of, of what we teach and because it all has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, don't do any of it, right. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but you need some of the things that we participate in now. We need those things explained to us. So again, my name is Mark Fuller. My company is Manager of Wealth. Everett, thank you so much for uh, having me on. I appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, much continued success with your show, brother. Oh, man, I appreciate you, Mark. Have a blessed and great day. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Wow. Um, just a phenomenal interview um, with Mark Fuller. Um, again, if you need his website, it is www.manageofwealth.com. That is www.manageofwealth.com. Just a blessing to have the brother drop some powerful knowledge. And um, we're going to try to get Mark back on soon just to discuss some powerful topics that we have to deal with in our community. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, we got a lot more shows coming up. Check out our website. A lot of things are on our website. We have um, added the CBPM. Um, Black Business Directory. So if you want to support a Black-owned business, check out our website at realtruthempower.org. Also, we're trying to push culture, so please support the brand. Um, we got some apparel out there that's conscious that you can wear it, feel Black pride. Um, so, man, again, another powerful interview. We talked about health and wealth, generational wealth. It was awesome. Um, and please just contact us. If you are a black business and you want your business promoted, email us at realtruthandpower at gmail.com. Or if you just want to share some knowledge or promote an event or something, give us a call. We're trying to get my man Clifton Sherrod coming up next. He's going to be talking about a lot of positive things he's doing in the community, especially for the youth. And um, once again, thank you so much for tuning in to Real Truth and Power Live. That was an interview with Mark Fuller from the Manager of Wealth. Um, he's the owner. And um, like you said, if you have any issues with finance or need education, they have a lot of systems in place to get you going to the next way. So again, we did it. What a great show. Thanks for tuning in. Real Truth and Power Live. Blessing to be here, giving you guys this great knowledge. Please like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Share this information. Let's get it out to the people. God bless. Hold up. Thank you for tuning in to the Real Truth and Power podcast, where we provide powerful content to uplift humanity, to uplift the black community. I'm your host, Everett Winchester. You can check our website out at realtruthandpower.org and you can also follow us on all social media, Facebook, um, Instagram, and um, thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned.